This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or by going to veteransradio.net where we're on the web 24-7. You can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.net. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We also want to thank Eisenhower Center. It's a brain injury recovery center. Learn more about eisenhowercenter.com. They're located in Michigan and in Florida. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at legalhelpforveterans.com. Contact us if you'd like to be a sponsor on Veterans Radio, and let's move on to our program. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today Ken Moffitt. Ken is uh, performing a unique role helping advance a Medal of Honor package for Bill Hawk Elbrick from his efforts in Vietnam in 1969, escaping from Firebase Kate. We've talked to Bill before on his book, um, uh, Abandoned in Hell, and we'll put a link to Bill's interview, but um, we're talking to a number of men who have helped shepherd or move forward Medal of Honor packages. I call them the the Medal of Honor Sherpas. And uh, Ken, that's why we have you on. Welcome to Veterans Radio. Well, thank you, Jim. I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, talk about this story and the, as you have indicated, the impediments that we have uh, faced uh, from the Army and, uh, well, frankly, some, some members of Congress. Well, let's set this up a little bit. It's 1969. Uh, Bill Albrook is a uh, new um, to Vietnam and is um, finds himself on at Firebase Kate, which is sort of in the middle highlands of Vietnam, over on the western edge, over by Cambodia. Somewhere along the line, the military planners have decided. We don't really care much about that uh, location, and we're not going to support it anymore. And the uh, North Viet Cong are coming in in droves from the west out of Cambodia and are about to overtake that hill and that uh, Bill finds himself on. Give us a a short snapshot of what happened that uh, over those uh, four or five days. Well, that's that's pretty accurate uh, to start with. Uh, Bill, Captain Albrecht, was sent out there to um, uh, lead the security detail of the mountain yards, the native, uh, um, native, they're, they're reminiscent of the native Americans. They are the indigenous people of the central highlands and they, uh, worked, uh, with special forces and so on to provide these very, uh, various missions. So captain Albrecht is sent out there to lead them. Uh, there was 27 Americans and about 132 of the mountain yards. Uh, Unbeknownst to the Americans, the North Vietnamese had been secretly uh, crossing the border. They had surrounded Firebase Kate with an estimated, these are official Army estimates, five to 6,000 North Vietnamese soldiers. These weren't the Viet Cong regulars. These were North Vietnamese hardcore trained soldiers. Their mission was to take out Firebase Kate, kill everybody. They were not taking prisoners move on to the special forces camp at Bu Prang, hopefully overrun Bu Prang, move up to the uh, provincial capital at Van Mituit, 
capture Ban Mi to it, cut South Vietnam in half, and the North Vietnamese or the communists would then control the northern portion of South Vietnam, eventually forcing the Saigon government to sue for peace. Uh, we know that that didn't happen, but in 1975, that's exactly the plan that they did. So Captain Albrecht finds himself here uh, surrounded and a five-day siege of relentless bombardment from RPGs, artillery, everything that the North Vietnamese had in their ordnance was raining down on Firebase Kate. And uh, they couldn't get supplies in. Uh, men were wounded. Men were dying. Uh, low on food ammunition, water was critical, and essentially uh, the American command said, we can't help you. There's nothing we can do for you. And Captain Albrecht uh, requested permission to abandon Firebase Kate. They said permission denied. He again asked for permission after he indicated that our artillery pieces are uh, destroyed. We have just become an impact area. And eventually the American command said, okay, but you're on your own. Get out as best you can. They tried to send some Air Force gunships, but mechanical problems uh, came up. And Bill, Captain Albrecht, was able to get uh, all of these Americans through enemy lines, pitch black at night. Uh, while these Viet, uh, North Vietnamese are surrounded the fire base, they're out there beating the bush trying to find these men. And Captain Albrecht was able to get them through all of this. Now, the one thing I would like to say real quickly is that Captain Albrecht had been wounded and the, his men said, you need to get medevac out of here and get that wound treated. And he said, I'm not going anywhere. He was the only infantry officer at Firebase Kate. There was a special forces sergeant, Dan Pirelli. Uh, everybody else was artillery. And for those of us that went through basic training, uh, eight weeks of basic training does not equate to uh, 16 weeks of advanced infantry school or anything like that. So they had the rudiments, but they didn't have the knowledge. And uh, in some of the in-depth interviews that were done with the individuals that escaped with Captain Albrecht, they uh, said without Captain Albrecht, we would have been dead. No ifs, ands, or buts. And uh, we've got that on tape. We have it on documentary. And we also have it in written notarized statements. Well, let me let me also do, again because we're kind of given short shrift to, by design to the the events of that five day period in uh, 1969 because we want to talk about the process a little bit. Bill ultimately gets awarded, as do a couple of other members, the Silver Star for for valor uh, on that hill. Um, but it's really not enough, and and there are eyewitnesses statements not only from the guys on the ground, but there are eyewitness statements from helicopter pilots and fixed wing guys who who looked down and saw the swarm coming at that hill and said, "There's no way these guys are going to get out of there alive." Isn't that true? That, that's exactly correct. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the helicopter pilots who ultimately became a retired was a uh, warrant officer at the time, and um, in his statement, um, which I'm looking at right now, ironically, he, you know, he served three tours in Vietnam, and in his statement, he said that uh, the fighting was so intense, so ferocious around Firebase Kate, that he says, quote, were as memorable as any that he ever seen in his tours in Vietnam. He also went on to say that um, he felt bad that they were unable to uh, supply the men. They desperately needed the ammunition and whatnot that, that he was going to deliver to them, but that the fighting was so intense they couldn't get the ammunition to them. And he says, quote, we had failed to resupply Kate that night, and I knew that those men were now dead men walking. Those men on Firebase Kate had absolutely no chance to fight their way out. And trying to do so was a suicide mission. He then goes on to say, those men in Firebase Cape were looking at sure death, and it wasn't going to be far away, perhaps that very night. I was at Bu Prang, that would be the Special Forces camp, the morning when Hawk, Captain Albrecht, and his men walked into the base from the heroic escape and evasion from Kate. I was stunned, yet overjoyed to see that they had escaped. 
Now, this is the, the part in his statement that really everybody should take care uh, note of. He said, everyone, including the senior military leadership involved in any capacity with Firebase Kate, knew the situation was hopeless and that the men at Kate were as good as dead. There was no hope of them surviving the NBA onslaught. And, and that is from and, uh, retired Colonel John Beckenauer. And one of the things that I want to get to is you've been on this journey as the Sherpa for this Medal of Honor package and the upgrade of the Silver Star to the Medal of Honor for about 10 years. And, and that's not unusual. Our veteran radio listeners may, may not uh, understand that these things often in the modern era take decades to develop into um, a determination by the Army and Department of Defense and the President and Congress that, that this is a worthy event that should receive the Medal of Honor. Tell us how you got started on this 10 years ago. Well, it started back in uh, 2010. I was I, I was working as a congressional aide for Congressman Bobby Schelling from Illinois in 2010, and this case uh, came upon my desk. And um, I was told I, I knew the periphery of, of Firebase Cape, but I didn't know the in-depth details. And when I was told that Captain Albrecht uh, was the only American that did not receive an award for any kind. For Firebase Kate, I said, well, that seems kind of odd since he was in charge of uh, the men there. So I dug deeper and deeper and deeper. And as I got more information, um, I just became stunned. And I, I, you know, as a Vietnam veteran myself, I'd heard horror stories. I've, you know, guys would come into the office and tell me all this stuff and so on and so forth. But this story and how, the magnitude of it and the magnitude of the heroism. And I got to be honest, uh, you know, not just Bill Albrecht, Captain Albrecht, but the other guys, too, that were able to hang in there and fight off the NBA. My hat goes off to them as well. But the Captain Albrecht was the only one that did not receive an award for valor or any kind of an award. It was just sort of odd. Well, as it turns out, the reason that he did not receive an award was because on the day that the award ceremony was held, uh, I believe it was at either Bonnie Tour or Play Coup, um, the General uh, Cochran sent his helicopter to pick up Bill, take him to the award ceremony. Bill was arriving late to the award ceremony because he diverted the helicopter to take some soldiers that had been wounded in a firefight to an aid station. Then he goes to the award ceremony. As he's arriving, the general's leaving Whatever, whatever award he was going to get. Bill, young 21-year-old captain, he was young like all of us at one point. Well, the award will catch up to me. Well, it never did. And it was at this point that when this was brought to my attention, uh, I talked to Congressman Schilling. He said, yeah, you pursue this and see what we can find out about this. It was at that point that I began to pursue it. And uh, we said, hey, this is this is worthy. I spoke with a couple of other senior uh, congressional offices and I ran the story by them and they agreed that this was the Medal of Honor. This was what the Medal of Honor was um, designed for. One of the congressional offices that I had spoken with, the veterans affairs worker, actually had worked on a Medal of Honor case. And he said, by all means, that's what this is. Well, and this starts as just, uh, hey, let's get him a simple upgrade. Uh, let's get him a silver star that he should have gotten probably to begin with. But then as the facts come out and as people look at this in hindsight, they realize, no, this is more than the Medal of Honor. And, and in fact, in 2017, you would uh, advance this to the Army Review Board Agency, which said, quote, the board unanimously agreed that the Silver Star does not adequately recognize the applicant's service during the period in question. The board recommends that the Department of Army records of the individual concerned be corrected by referring the recommendation to award him the Medal of Honor to the Senior Army Decorations Board to reconsider the recommendation to award him the Medal of Honor, end, end quote. Well, that's seven years to get him to say, hey, we ought to take a look at this. Well, it, 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 it's now four years later. Why hasn't this happened, uh, Ken Moffat? Oh, boy, I'm not a prophet, but uh, I can certainly tell you that uh, it seems as though, and this is, I've got I've to preface this by saying that 
this is conjecture on my part and, and the part of a lot of other individuals, including some members of Congress and some senior military people that I've spoken with about this, that we might be able to go back and link this thread to the events at Firebase Kate in 1969. When, as kept, I'm sorry, as Colonel Beckenauer indicated that the American Senior Military Command thought that every, those 27 Americans in those 132 mountain yards at Firebase Kate are dead. Write them off. Um, when they made it back, well, they've embarrassed us because we didn't go help them. We couldn't go help them. Well, let me let me, the uh, Special Forces uh, Mike Force attempted to get in to help, but the fighting was so severe that the Mike Force had to back off. The Mobile Strike Force had to back off. It was at that point that Captain Albrecht said, well, we're leaving Firebase Cape. We're not going to stay here and die. We're going to have to try and get these men out as best we can. So as he's leaving, they eventually... Uh, some nine hours later, I, I believe it was, linked up with the Mike Force, made it back to Buprang. Well, now they have embarrassed the military command because the military command, and we can put the blame on this, the Vietnamization. Now, for your listeners who don't know what Vietnamization is, that was when President Nixon was turning the war over to the South Vietnamese. The 4th Infantry Division up at Play Coup had enough men, helicopters, etc., that they could have gone to help. But they were told to stand down. The South Vietnamese command said, we're not going to help 27 Americans, let alone the mountain yards that we detest. Now, the interesting thing about this is that there is a newspaper article written November 4th, 1969, that appeared in the New York Times. And I have got a copy of that article where a senior military commander from the United States Army said that they're not committing any more troops to fighting in the Central Highlands. Guess where Firebase Kate was? The Central Highlands, because it's the South Vietnamese job to go and do the fighting, Vietnamization. Later on in that article, the writer quotes the South Vietnamese commander, the Arvins, Army of the Republic of Vietnam commander, as saying the same thing. We're not going to go commit our men to, those, to do any of the fighting there because we may need them elsewhere. So guess who's stuck in the middle of this political ping pong ball? Captain Albrecht at Firebase Kate. Well, that's, you know, that's 50 plus years ago now, and we're looking at this and thinking about a, a, a metal upgrade for Valor. As part of your role as the package Sherpa to try to move this up the hill, you have to be a little detective, a little historian, a little PR rep. To tell us how those different roles and functions have uh, uh, worked its way in over the last four or five years. Well, I'll start with the detective part first. Um, it was obviously like any congressional office does or anybody that's uh, doing work on a background, for any metal for that fact. Um, you've got to get as much information as you can. And it the, the information has got to be overwhelming. And it's got to point directly to the sacrifice, the selflessness of the individual. And that's what we were able to do by the records and the accounts of the individuals involved who happened to be at Firebase Kate, who made the escape and evasion with, with uh, Captain Albrecht. They all indicate that, yes, this is what he did. And they point to the fact that, that he was willing to stay there, although wounded, to lead them through this. So I got that information. I submitted it up to the Department of the Army, and they came back and they said, well, you know, that's all very well and nice. Um, we actually submitted about 165 pages of documents, including some of the actual radio traffic from the Air Force gunships, Buki 4-1, and Bill on the ground as the battle is developing. And you can hear Bill ask uh, Spooky 4 navigator for the Air Force, he unfortunately passed away, Al Dykes. Bill asked him, he said, uh, what's the hottest action in Vietnam? Al Dykes, the Air Force navigator, replies, it's Firebase Kate. You're the hottest thing going in Vietnam right now. So that indicates to me that for the entire country, of all the fighting that's going on, that the hottest battle is in the Central Highlands, and it's Firebase Kate. So we get all this information, send it up to the um, Fort Knox at the uh, Human Resources Command. They compile it. They send it up to the Department of the Army. The Department of the Army looks through it, and then they, they make their determination. 
when I found out that it was going to be the Silver Star, I was stunned, as well as were some people in the Pentagon, because I spoke with one of our liaisons at the Pentagon, and he said that, uh, yeah, the Army screwed up on this. Somehow or another, they did not get this right. I so then called the uh, chief of the awards and decoration branch at Fort Knox, and I asked him, he was a lieutenant colonel, lieutenant colonel Neubauer, and I, I was asking him about this, and he said, well, I can't tell you who the members of the board were. I can't tell you how they voted, but this is an interesting comment in a little one of the side notes. One of the people on the board said, well, Captain Albrecht was special forces. That's what we expect of him. So in other words, we're not going to give him anything special because he was just doing his job. If that's the case, then why do we have any awards or decorations at all? If everybody's just doing their job, they pick up a paycheck at the end of the month, why do we award anybody anything? Yeah, and, they're, they're, we, we, and we've certainly heard this before where the the rules that apply, the regulations that apply to different Valor Awards over time can kind of get a little corrupted or a, a little interpreted too cons- too tightly. L- like some folks think, well, you have to die to get the Medal of Honor, don't you? And that's absolutely not the, not the requirement, thank God. <laughs> I had heard that from several individuals that uh, he didn't die, so therefore um, it, it wasn't that big a deal. Now, one of the other interesting things, Jim, was the, the fact that when I was speaking with uh, our, one of our liaisons at the Pentagon, said that, you know, that the people on the review board, because this had been like 43, 44 years removed from Vietnam, that they were looking at things from the lens of Afghanistan and Iraq which is, uh, you know, you're comparing apples and oranges to totally, totally different engagements. And, but it shouldn't be because valor is valor. And when you are credited with the saving the lives of over 150 Americans and allied soldiers after being wounded, refused to be medevac, leading these men through all this, they credit you with this. And the army just says, nope. I'm sorry, but you're going to get the same award as these other two lieutenants. Well, and you understand a little bit that maybe it didn't happen right away because of the factual fog of war. Mm-hmm. And maybe you understand a little bit that the historical records can get lost. Nobody was, you know, they weren't they weren't in Vietnam to keep good records. Um, and right. and you've never met anybody who's got a Valor Award who did what they did to get the silver star or to be a medal of honor recipient. The, they're, that's not why they did it. And they're too humble to press this themselves. So it really takes you and a team of people really, while we're talking to Ken Moffat, it's not just you who is saying, Hey, t- army, take a better look at this. If this doesn't match up for the medal of honor recipient, I don't know who does. So talk about the team a little bit. Well, we first started off, uh, as I indicated, uh, with Congressman Schilling's office. Then, fortunately, he wasn't uh, reelected. So um, I was out of the political realm for oh, maybe a year or so. And then I went to work for an Illinois state senator, Neil Anderson. And Senator Anderson knew about Firebase Gate. His father in law is a Vietnam veteran. He knew Bill. And I went to Neil and said, Neil, if I'm going to work for you, I'd like to continue working on this case. And he said, absolutely. So now I'm out of the federal realm, but I'm in the state realm. But still, I had some contacts within the federal government that I could get documents and so on and so forth. So I had a lot of help for individuals who knew that this should have been the Medal of Honor. Um, Some people down at the NPRC, National Personal Records Center, um, I won't mention Rita's name because it might get her in trouble. Yeah, we're not supposed to get anybody on active duty in trouble no. here. <laughs> no, she, she's a civilian employee, and she's retiring in August, but she has been just a godsend. If I needed documents or whatnot, she would say, okay, I'll get them to you. And But there were other people, as you indicated, that other members of the military who had been at Firebase Kate, such as uh, Colonel Beckenauer, they began to make contact with individuals. And I started getting all of these uh, these different individuals and said, what can I do to help? Um, so we then reached out to our members of Congress and, and so on, and they did what they could do. But the Army kept saying, no, 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 we're not doing anything else. He got the Silver Star. That's it. 
But one of the interesting things about it was, and you read the quote from ARBA, that ARBA even indicated, the Army Review Board agency indicated that the Silver Star was inadequate, and they recommended the upgrade. goes to the Army, and the Army says no. So at this point, we're left with, okay, what do we do? And the only thing we can do is keep pressing. Um, I went to various members of Congress, House of Representatives, as well as the Senate. They sent letters on our behalf and so on. Uh, one of our members uh, over here in Iowa, uh, she sent, uh, Senator Ernst, as a matter of fact, sent a letter up to the Department of the Army requesting to know why it was denied. 16 months has gone by. The Army still has not responded to a sitting United States senator's letter. They just blew it off like well, you don't even matter. And, and I mentioned one of the roles you have to play when you're the Sherpa is the sort of publicity <laughs> agent because it takes – a, a a certain amount of um, folks getting behind this, whether they are congressional, whether they are the public, whether whether they are retired service members who were there. I mean, you got to have that drumbeat of folks saying, "Look at this! Look at this! Look at this!" And and that includes veteran service organizations. T- tell us a little bit about your partnering with veteran service organizations to look at this. Well, we, we do have the support of the Vietnam Veterans of America. They had a, a very nice letter from uh, the president uh, supporting the upgrade. Um, I was just in recent contact this afternoon, as a matter of fact, with the Special Forces Association. Uh, they are writing a letter of support for the upgrade. I've also been helped with uh, Bob Jackson, who is the director of operations for the vet, uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars. And Bob has been uh, very good with shepherding me through, to use your term, or shepherding me through, to use your term, um, with these various members of Congress. He's been doing this for a long, long time. And uh, he's actually going to be writing a letter on, on his behalf as the director of operations in support of the upgrade. We now have uh, three members of Congress, um, one from Iowa, two from Illinois. Um, I can mention the name if you're interested. Yeah, go Uh, right ahead. uh, Go right ahead, yes. uh, Representative Miller Meeks from Iowa, and where Bill lives, 2nd District of Iowa. She is his member of uh, the House. We have a member of the House from Illinois, Darren LaHood and U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth. Now, people say, well, he lives in Iowa. How come you have these two? Well, A, the case started in Illinois, and then Bill subsequently moved to Iowa. And B, the the law does not require that the individual live in the district. Actually, the Title 18 of of the law allows any member of Congress to submit on behalf of an individual. So, this is why we're doing this. But I wanted to get um, Miller Meeks, Bill's member of Congress, as well as uh, Representative LaHood and Senator Duckworth, um, because the case started here in Illinois. And Senator Duckworth being a, um, well, a disabled combat veteran certainly would have uh, empathy uh, for what Bill's going through, uh, as both of them are Purple Heart recipients. Um, and, you know, we're really pleased with the, the facts that so far they have stepped up to the plate. And uh, unfortunately, right now, things kind of slowed down because of the earmarks and everything. And once they get through with that, um, then they'll pick up speed and uh, take this and, and move forward with it to hopefully get some answers out of the Army, which the Army still has yet to answer. You ignored your own review board's recommendation. Why is that? It comes back to, are they embarrassed by what happened in 1969? The 4th Infantry Division wouldn't go help, couldn't go help. The Arvins certainly wouldn't go help. If, if that's what it is, Jim, here's the simple solution to that. If you made a mistake, acknowledge it, make the proper recommendation, the reward upgrade, and move on. Absolutely. Hey, Instead we're talking... Digging- We're talking to Ken Moffitt, who is working on moving forward a package to recognize uh, Captain Bill Hawk Albrecht as a, from a Silver Star to a Medal of Honor recipient. Ken, let's turn a little bit about, uh, if we can, to um, 
Uh, Bill's Bill's got a book out. Let's talk about that a little bit, and and a great documentary out. And there's a lot of YouTube videos out where you, people can learn more. Give them give them a little more uh, understanding of what happened back there in uh, Vietnam. Well, the the uh, the book is titled uh, "Abandoned in Hell: The Fight for Vietnam's Firebase Kate," and it's written by Marvin Wolf and co-authored with Bill Albrecht. Uh, Marvin himself is a Vietnam veteran, so when um, we were pleased that Marvin got on board, uh, not only because of his journalism background, but because of his background with the CAV division in Vietnam. So he, he spoke the language, uh, a military language, so to speak, and so we, we understood that he would do a good job. And once again, when the book came out, uh, rave reviews, and it um, is, is still selling well, actually, and, and I would encourage anybody if you're looking for a historically accurate view of what was taking place in 1969 in the Central Highlands, um, this is a great book. It's won all sorts of awards. Paul Kakert uh, with Storytellers International, um, I talked to him. Uh, he's from Davenport, Iowa, our area. And I met him and I talked to him and I ran the story by him. And he said, that's a phenomenal story. I'd love to do a documentary on that. Bill and I met with then Paul, and we set it up, and the documentary that uh, Paul came up with, Escape from Firebase Kate, um, he produced it, wrote it, and so on, and it, it in itself has won awards, uh, all sorts of awards. It was fe- featured at the GI Film Festival in Washington and San Diego. And in Branson, Missouri, as a matter of fact, it was so popular at the GI Film Festival in Branson, Missouri, that they ran it two years in a row. Uh, And and I got to tell a little side story about this. For those that have seen uh, the story of uh, Escape from Firebase Kate, um, the narration is done by a man named J.V. Martin. J.V. Martin is a very famous voiceover actor. He has done commercials, television shows, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I had the opportunity to speak to him. Uh, his father's a veteran. His father-in-law is a veteran. And, and I asked him, I said, uh, just out of cur- curiosity, JV, how much would you get paid for this? And he told me, and it was, I was like, wow. He said he turned it down because this was such an interesting and important story that he didn't feel like he should he should charge to do it. He just wanted to be part of this story. Yeah, and one of, yeah. one of the things I think, Ken, we're trying to get across to our veteran radio listeners is that when you work on a Medal of Honor upgrade, there's nothing in it for, for Ken Moffat. There's nothing in it. Heck, there's not even much in it for Bill Albrecht. What it's really about is we have to keep history alive. We don't teach enough history. And, and we don't want these types of heroics, this type of valors, uh, uh, to be ignored because the country loses out understanding what men will do for their, for their fellow mates. And it's, really, it's, it's important for the nation to advance this uh, uh, onto the Medal of Honor and to understand and the, the facts by reading the book or seeing the... the um, the documentary that's what this is really about isn't it it is you're 100 percent correct and especially in today's culture when um love of country uh and so on is um it's not pressed it's not taught you know one of the interesting things about this is the fact that um and even in the documentary one of the individuals ken hopkins makes reference to this when when those of us that served in vietnam came back uh, we were treated horribly. It, it's taken years before the American public realizes that the American soldiers who fought in Vietnam fought honorably. We fought with distinction. Um, we went where our country sent us. They asked us, and we went. And as a result of that, the um, attitude of, of hate and whatnot that we came back was misplaced. Instead of being grateful that Americans would go to fight for freedom, of the South Vietnamese, it was completely flipped. Well, and now, and, and yeah, and until you get into this, I, I mean, Bill and his men are holding that hill. They don't have the big picture at that time. They don't know, know what the what's coming in from the West and the idea to cut the country in half. And 
I, I mean, again, you have to be a bit of a historian to put all this together later to put it all in context rather, rather than just make the assumptions, oh, that was a stupid war. Well, that's true. Um, and, and once again, the South Vietnamese were fighting um, to maintain what little independence they had. Uh, you got to remember that they had only been, um, the nation had only been divided from uh, North and South for about maybe 10, 15 years. And here these people are trying to build a country, trying to build a government, and the North Vietnamese communists overrun in conjunction with the uh, Viet Minh or the Viet Cong. And the South Vietnamese have to fight the North Vietnamese as well as Viet Cong. They ask the United States for help. We go in to help them to maintain their freedom. Um, it was a noble cause, as, as President Reagan said. Um, unfortunately, some of the military leaders, uh, military leaders, the civilian political leaders, would not allow the military to do what was necessary to win. And we knew that pretty early on. But when you get into a situation like this, kind of it turns into a quagmire, uh, much like we're seeing in Afghanistan. But Bill and the 27 Americans at Firebase Kate were doing everything that they were told to do, everything that they were supposed to do, given the orders that they were given by the military command, which was given by the civilian leadership. Is, but you are right. Um, the, these were men who did and acted bravely and honorably, and it, that should be noted. Is there a point here, uh, Ken, that uh, maybe you... Uh, as, as the uh, as the shepherd of this package, maybe Bill is the guy who says, you know, enough. Is, is there a point at which the army says, we're not going to deal with you anymore, stop it? Um, is there a quitting point, or, or do you still have cards to play? Well, uh, first of all, Bill really doesn't get involved in this. Uh, <laughs> he only knows. Maybe a, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of what I'm doing. Um, he just stays to himself over there, and, and he doesn't. Uh, we don't discuss this much. Um, it is now, quite frankly, in in the hands of these three members of Congress that I mentioned earlier: uh, Representative Meeks, Representative LaHood, and uh, Senator Duckworth. I've done all that I can can I can do from as the civilian side. And I'm really grateful, once again, that they have stepped up and that they are going to say, yeah, we were going to do what's right and what's necessary to correct this injustice. Um, but, you know, I, I keep coming back to these events that is the Army hiding something? Um, why will you not tell? Let me back up real quickly. When you stop to consider, and I don't know if your audience knows this, and I don't even know if you know this, Jim. But let me read this to you real briefly. These are the awards and decorations that Captain Albrecht received for service in Vietnam. Combat Infantry Badge, three silver stars, five bronze stars, three for valor, an air medal with a V device for valor, ARCOM for valor, Vietnam Cross of Gallantry, Army Valorius Unit Award to the two core Mike Force for the Doc Siang Battle, 1970. He then goes on to be uh, a United States Secret Service agent, 25 years. So he's done all of this for his company, country, and the Army can't tell you why they will not grant the upgrade. Now, granted, by law, they do not have to. But you have somebody that has done that much service for their country, including being wounded three times. He received three Purple Hearts three times wounded, and you cannot just simply in a paragraph or two say, this is why, Captain Albrecht, you have not received the so I'm sorry, you have not received the upgrade. It just kind of baffles the mind. Why is that? Why did the Army dig in their heels? The other question, too, that has been asked, is the Army covering for a mistake that was made by the first review board, as indicated by the Army Review Board, ARBA, who said that, yeah, a mistake was made, the Silver Star is inadequate. Is the Army just kind of covering over this, hoping that it'll all go away? Well, let's let's hope that isn't the case, and let's hope it doesn't go away. And, and if uh, people want to help, um, Ken Moffitt, uh, 
should they email uh, Representative Meeks and LaHood and Senator Duckworth, or how, how do they how do they participate? How do they help out? If if it's uh, permissible, I'll give them my email address. Um, Go right ahead. I have I have contact with all three of these offices. Okay, it's uh, Moffitt, M O, F is in Frank, F is in Frank, E is in Edward, T is in Tom, T is in Tom, K is in Ken, S is in Sam, at gmail dot com. Well, we would encourage folks who have listened to this interview, maybe have read the book, Abandoned in Hell, or seen the documentary, Escape from Firebase Kate, and are so moved to reach out to Ken Moffat, give him some uh, support, uh, maybe have uh, some contacts with your congresspeople to say, hey, this is something folks ought to look at, and let's hope that uh, the next time we talk, we're able to report to our veteran radio listeners, Ken Moffat, that the Army is moving forward, and that uh, Captain Bill Albrook is going to get uh, the recognition and become a recipient of the Medal of Honor. Um, I might like to add that if they're interested in watching uh, Escape from Firebase, Kate, it can be seen on Amazon Prime. And it uh, it's uh, you have to track it down through documentary TV there, so that uh, it will give them a little head in the right direction. So... Um, Ken, thanks for the extra time that you've given us today on Veterans Radio. We appreciate understanding not only what uh, Captain Albrook did in Vietnam, but more importantly, sort of how this process moves along and where it currently sits. Thank you, Jim. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend some time with you and explain this story a little bit better. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to veteransradio.net. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, NVBDC.org, Eisenhower Center, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan, VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor, and the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. They keep us on the air, as does your support. Go to Facebook, go to veteransradio.net, and support our efforts. And until next time, you are dismissed. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.